Hi everyone. Today I will speak of an old concept, the concept of genes and alleles. The concept is well understood by most biology learners even before they reach the university floor. However, and despite its simplicity, this concept could be widely misunderstood and some of the assumptions could be confusing, misleading, or even wrong. So I will show you. Starting with the gene, the definition of a gene is very simple. It's a sequence of nucleotides that codes for a product that could be an RNA molecule or a polypeptide. This is the simplest definition of a gene. Now, focusing on this DNA instruction, we have a part that specifies the product, and this part is surrounded by two zones, the definition of which could prove sometimes very complex. To keep it simple, we have an upstream zone that we call promoter region, where the transcriptional machinery should sit and initiate transcription. And we have another zone downstream we refer to as termination region, where the process of transcription should come to an end and release the RNA molecule. The fate of such molecule depends on whether the gene is coding or non-coding. Now, a gene could have different forms. These forms we call alleles. Some alleles are functional and others are not. They could be inactivated. Now, in a population, there might be a number of alleles for a given gene. However, any individual can carry a maximum of two different alleles. So individuals are deployed. They could be either homozygotes or heterozygotes. Now, in the heterozygous condition, it happens that one of the two alleles is expressed. So we observe the phenotype corresponding to that allele, and the other allele is not. So the one, the allele that is expressed, we call dominant. The other one that is masked, not expressed, we call recessive. So in the heterozygote individual, we can tell that this allele is expressed. So you can predict the outcome, you can predict the phenotype. However, this relationship, dominant recessive, is considered by most as constant and regardless of the conditions, it wouldn't change. And here where the assumption is wrong. In fact, the relationships between the two alleles will depend on the prevailing conditions and on the phenotype that is under investigation. And two alleles can be in turn dominant recessive, recessive dominant, incompletely dominant or co-dominant, depending on the prevailing conditions and certainly on the phenotype that is observed or measured. I will show you today how this variation happens. So this assumption to be clarified, I will use a model which is well known, the sickle cell anemia, which is a genetic disorder that follows the autosomal recessive pattern. Let me show you. So this disorder is caused by a mutant version of the gene coding for the beta subunit of hemoglobin. So here we go. First of all, I'm Professor Fahad Nasr from the Lebanese University in Beirut. And today we are focusing on the concept of genes and alleles. So as I told you, I will use as a model the sickle cell anemia, which is caused by a muted version of the gene coding for the beta globin of hemoglobin, which is the red pigment of the red blood cells that is responsible of carrying oxygen throughout the body. On the top, you have the normal allele that we call HbA, and down you have the uh, mutant version or the abnormal allele. So they differ by a point mutation, very simple. Only point mutation in the code number six, converting the glutamic acid, which is the normal amino acid, into valine. And that conversion kills, in fact, 
the production of an abnormal version of the polypeptide, which might polymerize under, in fact, low oxygen concentration and cause the red blood cells to adopt a different shape that we call sickles. So the cells are sickled, are misshapen. Now, luckily here, the point mutation will change the uh, restriction site is not shown here on the slide. However, this enables, in fact, scientists to uh, proceed with the undernuclease restriction analysis to identify the two alleles, which is a molecular tool that we can use easily. So here I'm showing you two alleles. On the top, we have the HBA, the normal. On the bottom, we have the HBS, which is the abnormal allele. When they are together in the heterozygous, the individual is normal, which means that the normal allele is dominant and the HBS allele is the recessive version. So theoretically here we have a normal condition of recessive dominant between two alleles and such relationship would change depending on the prevailing condition as I will show you. The first question that we have to ask is about the frequency of the HBS allele. First of all, look at the sickle cells in human blood. You can distinguish easily those cells that are sickled. They have elongated shape and usually they are fragile and live for a short time. So this is the reason underlying uh, the anemia. We have on the next slide a better representation of the two uh, red blood cells. So the normal one having the smooth structure, round structure, so they move smoothly through the blood vessels, while the sickle cells, they are sticky. And because of that, because of their shape, because of their properties, they can uh, block and prevent the normal flow of blood, especially in the small vessels, leading to what we call vaso-occlusion. Here you have on the slide a representation of the HBS allele, with this uh, point mutation converting glutamic acid into valin. And you can see under low oxygen concentration how this hemoglobin will form polymer and later will cause the red blood cells to sickle. And as a result of this shape, those cells will block the flow of blood, especially on small vessels, leading to what we call extensive pain and further complication that can end up with organ failures and death. The sickle cell anemia, in fact, is uh, well managed by the uh, medical uh, practices. So there is no cure for the sickle cell anemia, but we do have many treatments that relieve the, the, the pain and prevent uh, those complications that might threaten the patient's uh, life. So this is not the fox of our speech, I will focus on the allele per se, and one of the questions that we raised at the beginning, whether the allele HBS, I mean the mutant version of the, of the gene, is equally frequent in all populations on our planet, and the answer is not. We found that the allele is more frequent in certain populations. In those populations living, for instance, under the uh, sub-Saharan region, Africa mainly, where malaria, which is a disease well known, uh, is still prevailing. Malaria, as you know, is caused by a parasite, the Plasmodium parasite, which is in fact transferred uh, through the Anopheles uh, mosquitoes, uh, biting uh, in fact the, uh, uh, the skin of humans to feed on their blood. So they transfer this uh, parasite, which causes malaria. So we have highly frequent allele in those regions where malaria is still prevailing. So do we have an association between the two observations? And the answer is yes. Obviously, the presence of the sickle cell allele, I mean the abnormal allele, HBS, is a bonus to those individuals, preventing them from contracting the most severe forms of malaria. So in simple terms, having the HBS allele, when allele, will make the individuals resistant to malaria, which is an advantage, obvious advantage of the 
of the allele and explains why the allele is more frequent in those regions. On this slide, you can see the selection of the sickle cell allele is positive. So starting from the top, the uh, HBS, I mean the uh, homozygous for the recessive allele, show very uh, low fitness when it comes to the uh, to anemia. And the both the homozygote for the dominant allele, HBA, and the heterozygote, HBA, HBS, show in fact uh, normal fitness. It could be intermediate for the uh, for the a, a small a. However, when it comes to the resistance to malaria, we have noticed that in fact having one allele, the sickle cell allele, will make them resistant and show high fitness. And this observation is amazing because it implies that an allele that could be crippling under some conditions could provide an advantage under others. And if we show this table where we challenge the concept, I will compare the, the relationship between the two alleles under different uh, conditions and while observing different phenotypes, starting with the top, the different genotypes are shown, the homozygous for the uh, normal allele, the heterozygous in the middle we call carriers or heterozygous, and the uh, uh, homozygous for the recessive allele, HBS, that are diseased, which means they develop anemia. Now, starting with the production of the beta globin, both alleles produce, in fact, uh, a polypeptide which means that uh, none of them is amorphic. And if you check for the presence of the polypeptide in the blood, you can see both of them, which means that the HBA and HBS are co-dominant. The terms co-dominant means that both alleles are expressed in the heterozygous. If you look at the shape of the red blood cells, as well as their concentration, starting with the sea level, where we have low pressure, in fact, high pressure and um, uh, uh, more oxygen, then you can see that the homozygous for the dominant allele and the heterozygous have normal phenotype. The uh, red, base, red blood cells have normal shape, and in terms of concentration, they are both normal. However, the homozygous for the recessive allele or for the HPS allele, they show, in fact, the problem. In terms of concentration, we have lower concentration of the normal red blood cells, and when it comes to the shape, many cells start to sickle. So under these conditions, the HBA is dominant and the HBS is recessive. If you consider the same phenotypes, I mean the shape of the red blood cells and their concentration at high altitude, where we have low pressure, low atmospheric pressures and less inhaled oxygen, then you can see very well that only the homozygous for the dominant allele for the HPA are normal. They have normal red blood cells shape and normal concentration. However, the heterozygous start, in fact, to suffer from the uh, prevailing condition where some cells are sickle and the concentration of the red blood cells is lower compared to the homozygous for the HPA allele. As far as the homozygous for HBS, here we have severe problems, so severe cycling of the cells and very low concentration of, in fact, the cells in the blood. So we have a disease condition, obvious disease conditions. So under those prevailing conditions, the A and S alleles show incomplete dominance because the heterozygous show intermediate, in fact, phenotype between the two extremes. And when it comes to the susceptibility to malaria, here, the normal, I mean, condition, the homozygous for the normal allele is completely susceptible, is susceptible, it's exposed to malaria and all the consequences of the infection, which could, in fact, be life-threatening. However, the carrier and the and the homozygous for the HBS, the abnormal allele, are resistant. So under these conditions, as you can see very well, suddenly the HBS is the dominant and the HBA is the recessive.
So this, in fact, example is one of many just to shed light on the uh, concept of genes and alleles, showing that two alleles could be alternately dominant recessive, vice versa, incompletely dominant or co-dominant, depending on the prevailing conditions as well as the methods of investigation or the phenotype that is being observed or measured. Before ending this short video, I still have two remarks. The first one is that a dominant or a functional a wild type allele could have many, in fact, molecular versions that are equally performing. I mean by that, the genotypes carrying those variants are doing fine and they have the same fitness. However, they are hidden. So it depends on the molecular tools that you have. You can unravel those alleles or not. So assuming that those alleles are slight, in fact, or have slight variations, could be point mutations, but all of them are producing a product that is equally functional, equally performant. So what we qualify those alleles? In fact, they are alleles embedded within alleles. So this notion will be explained somewhere else, but just keep in mind that uh, different alleles could be unraveled if you have the right molecular tool or biochemical matters. So we identify new variants or, in fact, uh, new alleles expressing or exhibiting a uh, different level of activity pertaining to specific phenotype. This is the first remark I would like to uh, explain and the second one coming back to the crippling uh, allele i mean the disease allele why that allele is still there why it has not been removed from the population from the gene pool now in the case of the sickle cell allele here there is a positive selection in favor why is that because the presence of that allele will impart the individual with a resistance against malaria so it accounts the, the high frequency of the alleles, in fact, accounts for the high frequency of resistance against malaria. So it's just a positive selection. However, assuming that we have a normal disease allele, why that allele is still there and did not disappear? And the answer you can see very well in the heterozygous condition that allele is protected. So it will remain in the population, the gene pool, and it will be exhibited once naturally in the homozygous condition where for instance in the progeny of a couple that are both heterozygous they could have uh, kids with the homozygous condition for this recessive allele so they would develop the uh, the disease so that condition where the recessive allele or the disease allele is protected in the heterozygous is called protected polymorphism or balanced polymorphism. So we have here tackled in this short video a number of assumptions of the uh, of the uh, concept for genes and alleles. I would have, in fact, uh, other videos uh, to focus on on the ramifications of this concept to explain uh, further details, especially when alleles are embedded within alleles. If you like this video or you have comments, please uh, leave a comment. I will get back to you. And if you have any private requests, like a potential collaboration, future collaboration between us, please use uh, the following email to contact me directly. I hope you have enjoyed this video and see you next time. Goodbye.